for one reason or another, you're needing to stop intermittent fasting. Okay, maybe you are just tired of it. Maybe you're hitting a plateau and you want to change it up. That's totally normal. Or maybe you're going on some extended travel, or you're going on a vacation or a business trip, and you just you know that you won't be able to fast. Well, it's very important that you come off of a fast properly. And I don't mean come off of a fast in the individual day sense. I mean come off of a fast regimen, right? So that you aren't just going back into eating normally and rebound. So I'm going to teach you how to prevent the rebound when you switch away from an intermittent fasting regimen. I'm going to give you all the breakdown. A lot of it simply has to do with making sure we don't have a heavy immune response because when we come off fasting, our bodies are very sensitive. Now, another thing that you need to know is contrary to what many people will say, when you are intermittent fasting, your metabolism is indeed slowing down. You're eating less calories. You're going periods of time without eating. Of course, your metabolism is slowing down. Is that a bad thing? Not at all. It's metabolic efficiency. We need to change how we look at the metabolism as a speed thing. It's not all about revving up the metabolism all the time. It's all about efficiency and working within that. So that being said, because your metabolism has effectively slowed down and you lost weight, so your metabolism is less, you just need to make sure that you're paying close attention to how you go back into a normal eating regimen. So we're going to break it all down. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. We've got new videos on, uh, well, just about every day nowadays. So it's 7.30 a.m. Pacific time, so the red subscribe button. Then I want you to hit that bell icon so you can turn on notifications and get push notifications whenever I go live. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is a kind of a cheesy term. It's called metaflammation, and I didn't make this up. Okay, This term was coined in a study that was published in the journal Cell. And what metaflammation talks about is that when we overeat in one sitting, we end up having an influx of nutrients that actually cause our immune system to go on attack. Now, you've probably heard of inflammation in general. Inflammation, like when we have uh, a virus come in or when we have bacteria come in, our body sends inflammation out to attack and ultimately protect our body. Now, when inflammation is happening too much, it becomes a problem. Uh, an example would be people with an autoimmune condition. Okay, Those are people where their immune systems are constantly on attacking parts of their body, causing big problems, lupus, Hashimoto, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, anything like that. Well, guess what? Metaflammation is where inflammation attacks the metabolism and shuts it down, and it happens much easier. So this study took a look at what happens if you overfed uh, a subject. If you overfed a subject, what would happen was this normally dormant gene known as PKR would become not dormant. It would get activated. So normally PKR would only get activated when there's a lot of uh, viral activity. If a virus is coming in or bacteria is coming in, then PKR would get activated and it would go on attack. But PKR was getting activated when there was too much in the way of nutrients coming in. So if someone ate too much at one sitting, then PKR would turn on and trigger inflammation to attack the nutrients. Therefore, turning down the metabolism because it would literally shut down the metabolism as a protective mechanism. Hence the word metaflammation, inflammation within the metabolism. As cheesy as it sounds, it's a legit thing, this PKR thing we don't want to activate via lots of food. So the reason I'm saying this is when you come off of an intermittent fasting regimen, it's easy to activate PKR because you're insulin sensitive and it's easy to just start eating more than your body's used to. Okay, So it's very, very important to break your meals up into smaller meals. This sounds crazy, and don't hate me for saying this, because I'm always the guy that says don't eat four or five smaller meals. But in this particular case, for a period of time, you might want to eat four or five smaller meals, maybe three or four. Five might be a little overzealous, and if you're traveling, that's pretty hard to do. The trick is making them very clear. You're not snacking and grazing throughout the day. You're just having smaller meals that by no means are amounting to more calories than you would eat when you normally break your fast, okay? So if you normally eat 2,000 calories during your fasting window, by no means should you be exceeding 2,000 calories throughout the entirety of the day. So four meals would be four 500 calorie meals spread evenly throughout the day. Again, by no means should you be exceeding what you ate during your eating window. You should actually continue to lose weight if you follow this regime properly. Okay, now it brings me into the next thing you need to pay attention to, and it still lines up with inflammation. You really should follow some kind of either autoimmune paleo approach, I'll explain it all, a carnivore approach, or some kind of introductory diet. Here's what that means. The carnivore diet, now let me say this actually, I'm not a carnivore guy. I don't do carnivore. I've done carnivore and through my experience it has some very powerful, powerful mechanisms within its just entirety. Okay, 
the whole idea behind carnivore is to be anti-inflammatory. You have less nutrients coming in, just very simple things that your body can process. That is exactly why when you're coming off of an intermittent fasting regimen, it's actually easy to just do carnivore for a couple of weeks because it's less impactful from an inflammation standpoint and an autoimmune standpoint. And it's quite easy to do when you're traveling because it's easy to just get meat and not have a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so simply put, it's easier on the immune system to eat the meat than it is to go another route and bombard yourself with nutrients all the time. If you bombard yourself with nutrients, we run into this whole protein kinase PKR issue again, like we talked about with metaflammation. So we don't want that to happen. If you don't want to do carnivore, no big deal. The thing that you want to pay attention to is doing more of an introductory diet. Now what that means is introducing small amounts of food in terms of the diversity, and then slowly introduce more, okay? So if eat one type of food or two or three types of food and repeat those for a little while and slowly introduce more foods so your body has a chance to ramp up the proper immune activity so you're not just flooding your body with nutrients all at once, okay? Trust me, this inflammation is not what you want. That will affect your metabolism, it will slow things down, and it will quite frankly just make you feel lethargic and miserable. I know this sounds like I'm making it overcomplicated, but I'm not. I'm actually trying to make it simple for you because if you can just eat the same kinds of things for a couple weeks, it actually makes life easy. Lastly, go keto within the spectrum, okay? Keep it low carb, you don't want big insulin spikes, okay? No matter what, we don't want an insulin spike. So even if you are not keto, when you practice intermittent fasting for a couple of weeks after coming off of fasting, please just go keto. Even if you don't have the fats high, it's all about keeping the insulin levels a little bit lower so we don't have these big spikes. Now, the next thing I want you to pay attention to is breaking, of course, your diet into three smaller keto meals or four smaller keto meals, kind of to bridge on what I was already saying. But this is all about the insulin activity, okay? So like I started to talk about, every time we eat, we have an insulin spike. And when you come off of fasting, you're highly insulin sensitive. Okay, you don't eat a whole lot. So think of it like a bouncy ball. Every time you eat, that bouncy ball bounces, and then it bounces again, bounces again, until it gets a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller bounce, okay? So your insulin sensitivity is sort of like a bouncy ball. If you are doing intermittent fasting and you're only eating one or two times per day normally, then each time you bounce, you're not losing a whole lot. But as soon as you start adding in more meals where you're spiking your insulin, then you're reducing that sensitivity, okay? So basically my point is saying that because you're eating so infrequently, you're very insulin sensitive. So as you start eating more frequently, you wanna make sure that you're eating a ketogenic style diet so you're not spiking your insulin a whole lot and throwing things off. You want that bouncy ball to stay nice and controlled all the time so you're not getting insulin resistant or anything like that. Now the journal Nutrition and Metabolism published a study, it's a pretty long-winded study, but ultimately what they found is that a very low carb ketogenic diet ended up reducing fasting insulin levels by 33%. So you don't wanna come off of a fasting protocol and then just go into a bunch of carbs. If you go with a keto diet, you'll keep your insulin levels 33% lower, 33% less instance of potentially gaining fat via the insulin route. Um, just in case you guys haven't checked them out, down in the description there's a link for Thrive Market. If you've seen my channel, then you know the drill here, but if you haven't, then this is really interesting stuff. I've created specific keto grocery bundles through Thrive Market, so Thrive Market's an online grocery store. So down in the description, you can click on that link and check out Thrive Market. You get groceries delivered right to your doorstep, never have to go to the grocery store, but the coolest part of this whole thing is I've been able to compile different grocery boxes. So in this particular case, it's a keto grocery box with different keto snacks, keto meals, things like that that I approve of, that I think are good. I actually assembled the box. So after you finish watching this video, you're gonna wanna check them out down in the description, get a special discount on all those groceries. Honestly, cheaper than the grocery store, easier, and right to the doorstep. So now let's go ahead and move into the next thing, which is going to be don't snack. And I know it sounds weird because I'm saying, hey, we eat, eat a few more frequent meals. Well, no, it's all about not snacking between those meals. Mm. Do not graze. It's all about the insulin again. Every time we eat, we spike our insulin. When our insulin is spiked, glucagon is suppressed. Glucagon is what ultimately allows hormone-sensitive lipase to be activated, which therefore allows you to burn fat. Okay, so please, please do not snack. If you're eating three or four meals, keep them confined to that time period and do not snack in between. In fact, the journal Diabetologica published a study that found that when subjects ate six square meals per day or two square meals per day, with the same amount of calories, they found that the group that ate two square meals actually ended up burning more fat than the other group. Somewhat not apples to apples in this case because I'm telling you to eat semi-frequently, but my reason in saying this is that 
the more frequently generally we do eat, the more insulin spikes we have and the less opportunities to burn fat. So that means every time you eat something, you're stopping an opportunity to burn fat. So even if I have you eating four meals right now, if you're grabbing a peanut in between those two meals or in between any of those meals, you're turning off the fat burning system. So even if your calories at the end of the day are the same, if you eat 2,000 calories and the person next to you eats 2,000 calories, but they're grazing all day and you're eating in four or five square meals, you're gonna burn more fat because you have more opportunities to turn on hormone sensitive lipase and activate the glucagon pathway. And lastly, two quick little things. Still continue to train fasted. Just because you aren't doing intermittent fasting anymore doesn't mean that you shouldn't be training in a fasted state first thing in the morning. Okay, and if you can't train first thing in the morning, train as close to an empty stomach as you possibly can in the afternoon, hours after lunch, for example. Next one is a big one, believe it or not, and that is still commit to not fasting. Okay, because so many people get so addicted to fasting, they come off of fasting and then they're like, oh, well, it's too hard today, I'm just gonna fast again. And then you're falling right back into the trap and you're not actually letting yourself repair. I love fasting and I wanna fast all the time, but there also comes a clear line when I need to draw a line in the sand. I need to say, wait a minute, I'm not fasting for these next two weeks because I'm resetting my metabolism, getting back on track, and there are times when I want to go into a fast because it's just easier and what my body feels used to but I need to let my body recover so I don't rebound because otherwise my metabolism is doing this and then it's just getting all herky jerky and then it throws off the whole system. So anyhow, write these things down, write down everything I explained, use it as your protocol. If you're going on vacation, if you're going out of town, if you need to take a month off, follow this protocol. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel and please do check out Thrive Market down in the description. They're a huge sponsor of this channel and they've made it possible for me to create cool food options for people that watch my videos. So it's pretty awesome. See you guys in the next video.